we will start with a, our keynote speaker, which I think we don't need to introduce. That's um, George Holloway. George Holloway um, is an assistant professor in the Department of Ethnomusicology in Nanhua or Nanhua, Nanhua University of Taiwan. Studied composition uh, under uh, Michael Finnessy and Robert Saxton, and um, will um, discuss. He will discuss the aesthetic and stylistic background in his solo uh, pieces, some pieces of him. And I remember a couple of days ago we had um, a very nice discussion up in the third floor, and um, from his. Um, uh, from his text that I read here, I like especially uh, following a sentence. Composers are not strictly ethnomusicologists because they are not bound to faithfully record and analyze ethnomusicological phenomena as encountered in context. So, George, we are happy to have you here. Please. Thank you, Harry. And uh, thank you to the scholarly committee for inviting me. Uh, my talk today is Composition as an Extension of Ethnomusicology, uh, the channeling, channeling of traditional gestures and embellishments of six schools of Gujang playing in hook for solo Gujang, and the possible role of machine learning as an extension of transcription in compositional practice. <clears throat> Um, my talk today will touch upon the following themes, um, culturally specific artistic conceptions and rhetorics, allusion to traditional musics in transformed contexts, uh, the interaction between ethnomusicology and composition, the ideal ideology of the Chinese school, and potential applications of machine learning as a tool of transcription, uh, which is an ongoing research. So here is some information about myself. Um, I've highlighted perhaps the most pertinent details for today's talk. Uh, I have been living and making music in Asia for 11 years now. Um, if I had to summarize my musical influences as a composer, I would say that my music is rooted in the modernist tradition of Western art music with specific affinities to uh, new complexity and British experimentalism. Um, but it also draws on the Anglican choral tradition. I was a choral scholar at Oxford, and that's especially influenced the way I write for uh, The Voice. Um, and since about 2007 or 2008, uh, I've been interested in traditional musics of China and Taiwan. So I've written works for traditional sheng, um, multiple chamber works featuring Chinese instruments, um, for also for gagaku or ya yue ensemble and works uh, setting chinese texts uh, the focus of today's talk is my piece for solo gujang hook which was premiered three weeks ago in taipei at the taipei international new music festival by guo jing mu um, who is this player here uh, the piece has also been recorded by Chen Yuhan uh, for a new project about which I shall speak later on. The initial inspiration for Hook uh, goes back to 2013. I was studying conducting at the Central Conservatory of Music uh, in Beijing, and uh, I shared a dorm room with a, a Taiwanese Gujang player uh, called Huang Weijie. Uh, and one day he uh, uh, because the practice rooms are all full, he brought his gujang back to the uh, dormitory uh, uh, to practice. And the thing that he played was this. I can press down, I think.
So that, this is a piece called Mountains and Flowing Water. It's very famous in China. Um, uh, but I was very struck by it because it was completely different from the music I'd heard for Gu Gujang before. Um, previously, I'd heard music that was very loud, busy, ebullient, um, showy, um, uh, and, uh, and dramatic. And uh, so I asked him, so what would tell me about this piece? And I realized it was um, a piece from the Zhejiang school of Gujang playing. And so that was the first time I'd realized that there were lots of different schools of Gujang playing. Um, and this uh, led to a, a creative impulse or a creative idea, which I had, which was that I, I was really interested to un understand the differences between these different schools and um, and to actually compose a piece which evoked or even catalogued different Zhengpai, uh, Zhengpai as they're called, uh, Gujang schools. Um, now, uh, given that I was composing for one of China's most emblematic instruments, uh, it, it was very important for me that this piece should have a clear Yijing or creative conception. Um, uh, Yijing also connotes a certain psychic state or atmosphere that permeates the music uh, and is an important aesthetic concept in Chinese musical aesthetics. I deliberately chose an explicitly Chinese Yi Jing for the work, uh, namely a Tang Dynasty poem by Li Yu, uh, known by the name of the tune to which it would have been sung, Xiang Jian Huan. Um, now, in choosing an explicitly Chinese inspiration for the piece, I was not so much asserting a particular national allegiance or crafting a particular cultural identity for myself. I was mainly reflecting a personal enthusiasm for the, this period of poetry and responding to a sense that it has something to offer by way of inspiration for a composer. Um, so as you can see, Li Yu was a 10th century poet uh, he was also last monarch of the Southern Tang Dynasty, based in central uh, China, uh, as well as a painter, calligrapher, and musician. Uh, Taizu, who was the founder of the Song Dynasty, the next dynasty, invaded Liu's kingdom in 974 and put him under a house arrest. Um, and Taizu's brother and successor, Tai Taizong, had Liu poisoned in um, 976. Uh, and this poem was written during Liu's house arrest uh, around 975. So uh, here is my translation of the poem. Mute and alone I ascend the west tower. The moon is like a hook. The lonely parasol tree in the deep courtyard encapsulates the clear autumn. Cut it and it will not break. Tidy it and chaos remains. That's the pain of separation. It's no ordinary taste in the heart. Um, so this is the uh, poem in the original Chinese. And as you can see, it, um, it has very few characters. Uh, in fact, it has 36 characters divided into two stanzas of three sentences, uh, each containing six, three, and nine characters. Um, respectively. I had the idea of using the poem as an unheard cantilena uh, that threads through the work as a voiceless setting of the poem. Uh, the piece, in fact, divides into three large sections, uh, each of which represents one complete statement of the cantilena. So you could say that Hook is structurally tri-rotational. Um, and this idea of the voiceless uh, setting uh, might have been unconsciously influenced by the uh, the first two characters of the poem, which mean mute or without words. So in order to explain my thinking behind the cantilena, uh, I need to discuss briefly the tones in spoken Chinese. So as you may know, um, standard Mandarin Chinese has four tones. So using the syllable ma to, uh, to represent it, it would be uh, the first tone ma, the second tone, ma, the third tone, ma, and the fourth tone, ma. Okay, so I'm sure many of you will have seen this kind of diagram before to represent the tones in spoken Chinese. Um, when it comes to setting Chinese to music, certain types of music in China or in Chinese culture uh, will, as it were, respect the um, 
the tones the melodic contour of the music respects the tones and uh, for, uh examples are quin opera uh beijing opera and a lot of art song um by um western influenced composers uh on the other hand there are also forms which completely disregard the tones um for example tang dynasty court music uh, most commercial music, uh, music for musicals and that kind of thing. Um, and perhaps that that could be explained because of the uh, the, the, the stylistic influence from, from the West, um, which dictates a different kind of melodic contour to the music. <clears throat> um, below, I've, I've written out the tones above the poem for you to see. And... Um, uh, I have a, I found a recitation here of the poem, so you can hear the musical quality of the original Chinese. Wu Yan, Du Shang Xi Lou, Yue Ru Gou, Ji Mo Wu Tong, Shen Yuan Suo Qing Qiu, Qian Bu Duan, Li Hai Luan, Shi Li Chou. 別是一般滋味在心頭。無言。Okay, <laughs> so uh, the idea of using a text to guide uh, melodic contour in a non-vocal piece is not at all new. After all, in traditional Chinese opera forms, the text is the texture of the music is heterophonic. Uh, and so all of the instruments are to a greater or lesser extent following the sung melody anyway. Uh, in contemporary art music, however, one notable example of this approach is from Chen Yi, the Chinese-American composer. Her fiddle suite for Hu Qin solo and, um, and orchestra um, in the second movement, which is called reciting, um, actually uh, has a kind of voiceless setting of a, of a Chinese poem and she actually writes as you can see here uh, the the characters of the poetry over the uh, the Jonghu part the solo part um, as it were telling the Jonghu player uh, what the the character the theoretical character is that he or she is reciting uh, but of course the, the character is not actually spoken um, so just to by way of a comparison I want to play the recitation of the poem first that uh, Chen Yi is using, and then we'll hear the uh, an extract of the piece. Okay, and then this is how the piece sounds. Okay, so you have an idea of the uh, what it sounds like in Chinese piece using this kind of voiceless setting of a text. So in terms of the pitch content of the cantilena, um, I gave each line of the poem its own vertical set uh, constructed out of the pitches from two different octaves of the instrument's range. Um, so as you can see, the guzheng actually has 21 strings um, uh, covering four octaves. And each octave has only five strings available to be used. The traditional uh, tuning is pentatonic, uh, a, pent a major pentatonic on D. Um, 
So although the bridges can the move the bridges on the instrument can be moved during a performance, it is uh, much less convenient than it is for the Japanese koto, uh, owing to string tension. So it is uh, it is somewhat akin to asking a guitarist to retune mid piece. Uh, it's doable, but it requires some thought. So in hook, I chose to stick with the same tuning for the whole piece, which is the scordatura I have. I've, I'm showing you here. Um, So in this way, by giving uh, a different vertical set to each line of the poem, constructed out of these combinations of the pitches from different octaves, um, uh, each line has its own slightly different harmonic color and tension. Um, this is the cant cantilena I devised for hook, uh, which I notated for myself somewhat in the manner of an unmeasured prelude of Rameau. Uh, but this never explicitly appears in the piece. Uh, rather, it functions as a thread on which I hang my material. Um, so you can so you can you can get an idea of the, the sort of uh, approach I took to, to composing this melody and the relationship to the lines of the poem. So you just have to trust me that I follow the uh, tones of the original Mandarin Speaking of the material hung on this thread of the cantilena, you'll recall that I mentioned above the traditional schools of Gujang playing. I, fo uh, I focus, um, I focus the cantilena through this series of stylistic lenses, such that each of the three rotations of the cantilena is each focalized, as it were, by two different schools. So six in total: Zhejiang, Chaozhou, Henan, Shanxi, Shandong and uh, uh and i've shown you on the map where these different locations are so you can see uh, generally the geogra geographical spread of these different schools um and i just want to um uh, recognize uh my gratitude to uh yang yihua uh, who's a gujang player in taiwan who uh very generously gave me some of her time for explaining uh the characteristics of these different schools um so uh i will go through the six different schools um uh, in sequence and and then explain to you how i use each one in in the piece hook so the first one is the zhejiang school and my model for this was a piece called the lofty moon um, now you'll see on the on the screen that i've given you the notation of the original piece this is the chinese uh traditional notation um, using numbers um, instead of uh, notes on a stave. The salient characteristics of the Zhejiang school, um, or ones which I particularly picked up on, um, are the two-handed glissando. So for example, in this example, you have a, a gl double glissando being performed with both hands on the instrument. Um, dyads with upwards bends so uh, the dyads on adjacent strings and the the player presses to the left of the bridge the movable bridge to uh, raise the pitch of the lower string up to a unison with the upper string rather like the way electric guitarists do um, and uh, you can see that here um, the Actually, the notation was wrong originally, so I've I've corrected it. It's the lower string which um, is bent up to the pitch of the upper string, um, and then finally three note chords also with the upwards bend. So, uh, and and with quarter tonal inflections. So you can see here I've marked out the three note chords, each of which has this upwards arrow showing the bend of the string. Uh, so this is how it sounds in. Uh, the Lofty Moon. That's the, the two-hand glissando. And those are the dyads with the bend.
Okay. And this is how it sounds in my piece, Hook. So you can see the uh, the double the piece begins with this double um, glissando using both hands, and then we have the three note chord with the bend up to the unison, and another three note chord with a a bend here, and then the two note the dyad with the bend here. Okay. The second school is the Chaozhou school from Guangdong in southern China, and my model for this was jackdaws playing in the water. Um, of which I've given you some extracts here. The salient characteristics of this school um, are a simple melody with um, vibrato on, on certain notes and uh, quick downward glissandi leading towards certain melody notes. And in this particular piece, the notation used is this kind of star with the line going down. So when you see this, that's a glissando, an upwards glissando from a, an undeterminate or a non-determined pitch down to the pitch of the melody notes. Um, and also um, prominent quarter tones on the non-pentatonic notes. So uh, notes four and seven in, in the original, uh, you know, in the traditional style, uh, which require string bends, are bent in such a way that they produce um, quarter tones. So uh, a quarter sharp four and a quarter flat seven with vibrato. So that sounds like this. You have a downward glissando to the melody notes and the slightly quarter tonal uh, and the slightly quarter tonal four. Okay. Another characteristic is that there are a number of different tempos uh, in the piece. Um, so the second tempo is a kind of fast tempo with quarter note equaling one, two, eight, uh, with lots of syncopated dyads. Um, and you can see on the, on the musical example where there's a zero, that's actually a rest in the Chinese notation. So you have these rests and then the notes on the offbeat and dyads on the offbeats. Um, the, the, the time signature here is one, four, which is also an interesting characteristic of this style. Um, and this kind of beat with the syncopations on the offbeat is called whipped beat. And it sounds like this. Okay, so that's the whipped beat. And then the third one is the third tactus, which is just a very, very fast tempo. Okay, and that's also in one four time. Okay, in my piece, it sounds like this. This is the Chaozhou school in my piece. So these are the whipped beats.
And this is the third taxus, the very fast one. And I think the player could have played it a bit faster even. Okay, so the next the next school is the Hernan school. Um, and my model was Chen Xingyuan falls into the courtyard. Um, now, the salient characteristics of this school are that the, um, the player pre-presses a note before plucking it and then releases the note after plucking so that you have a downward glissando. And this is often accompanied with a very intense vibrato. Um, and also bends, which, uh, which either bend a sharp four up to a five or a seven up to a one. Um, often played against a lower octave. Um, so you can see, um, for example, here, the bend. Uh, so this note is actually played on on an E, on the E string, and it's bent up to the G and then released to a F sharp and then pre repressed to uh, go up to ascend again to the G. Okay, so that it sounds like this. Okay, and in hook, uh, it, I, I put this material in the lowest register of the instrument, so it sounds quite different, but uh, gesturally it's quite similar. So you get a feel for that. Okay, the next one is the Shanxi School from Northwest China. Um, and actually this piece isn't a traditional piece. It was composed in the 1970s, uh, but it draws upon certain aspects of the the, the traditional, traditional opera from Shanxi. Um, and uh, its salient characteristics are large upwards sweeping glissandi leading towards a tremolo note. Now, on the notation, actually, it's not very clear, but this is actually a glissando here, uh, going from a low C to a high C, and then arriving at the at this D, a high D with a tre tremolo. Um, and that sounds like this. Okay, um, and uh, another characteristic is the uh, unisons using string bends again, um, and also something quite characteristic of the Shanxi school, which is called bitter notes or crying notes, and they're a kind of uh, quarter tonally sharp four uh, with a very intense vibrato, um, and also the use of uh, notes four and seven as a, a kind of passing note. Um, which you'll hear in this example. Here's the passing note. It was quite subtle. And in hook, it appears like this. Okay. 
Okay, so you can see the crying note on the G quarter sharp here. That's the crying note or the bitter note. Okay, the next one is the Shandong School from Eastern China. And the model for this was a piece called the Four Brocade Strips. Um, the salient characteristics of this school are uh, note repetitions on adjacent strings with vibrato or lower mordants. So um, here, for example, you can see there's a uh, the player uses the A string to play um, the uh, play a C and then a lower mordant and then a bend back up to the C again. Um, and they hold the bend. So they hold the bend all the way through all of these Cs. So that all none of these Cs are actually played on the C string. They're all played on the A string. Um, and also another characteristic is the use of, the, of thumb only descending scalar figures. So you can see the, the fingering markings here. These are fingering markings which tell the player to use the thumb and then maintain the use of the thumb through this figure. So they're drawing the thumb across the strings. Um, which gives a particular kind of tone color to the um, the, the scalar scalic figure, uh, and it sounds like this. So there's the mordant, the lower mordant. And there's the thumb only glissando. Okay, and in my piece, it's also it also appears in the lower register. Okay, so that's that's an impression of the Shandong. The last one is Hakka, um, and that's from southern China and um, from Fujian province and Taiwan. Uh, and the model for this was a piece very evo evocatively titled Night Rain on the Banana Wood Window. Um, and its salient characteristics are a very slow, spacious, elegant music. Lots of octaves on the strong beats, uh, to emphasize uh, important melody notes and very prominent slow bends, uh, as you'll hear in this example. Um, another aspect is the short anacrutic downward glissando uh, that marks the starts of the gestures. So it's a little bit like the previous, um, the previous style, uh, the Shandong style. Um, and you can see in the notation, actually, in this particular piece, these downward glissandos are actually notate, they're written out. Um, Lots of very gentle downward glissandos to particular notes. Okay, and in my piece, it sounds like this. So there's one more piece of material that I need to share with you, which is what I've called the alienated material. It doesn't belong to any of the other schools, um, but rather it utilizes and attempts to rehabilitate a cliche from contemporary Gujang music. Uh, the technique of playing to the left of the movable bridges. And this is used by almost every contemporary composer, and it has become both emblematic of contemporary Gujang music, but also often a lazy cliche. Uh, it has ceased to be expressive anything, of anything other than the technique itself. 
And so I wanted to find a non-cliched and expressively justified way of employing this performance technique uh, and one that related to the poem. You may remember that the last line of the poem refers to the no ordinary taste in the heart. Um, I reserve this playing technique specially for the end of each rotation of the cantilena as a way of representing this strange, disquieted and alienated feeling described by the poet. In general, I dislike showy techniques which are designed to prove to an audience that one can use the technique or for the sake of sounding contemporary or edgy. Um, so I try to integrate the, uh, the, the technique into the idea of the piece. Um, now, an interesting thing about this is that because of, because every gujang is different, uh, this material will sound different on every instrument. So um, I just want to share with you how it sounds on two different gujangs played by two different players. And then this is another one. So you get a kind of aleatoric effect um, with, with um, non-tempered tunings resulting. Okay, so... Um, I'd like to play you the, the whole piece, Hook. Um, it's about 11 minutes, okay.
So I have to ask uh, the chair, yes. because I actually have about 10 more minutes of prepared material. Yeah. But the, so the question is, am I allowed to? Of course. Am I? Okay. Of course. If, if everyone will allow me. Thank you. Well, okay. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> okay. So working uh, as I do in an ethnomusicology department, I feel I should emphasize that I'm not an ethnomusicologist and what I'm doing in this piece is not ethnomusicology. Um, so as we all know, ethnomusicology involves transcribing, collating, analyzing, understanding and explaining uh, the materials under investigation, along with a whole, a, a whole number of other activities. Uh, and in composing Hook, uh, I was transcribing, I was collating, and I was doing some analyzing and uh, some understanding. But mostly it's a creative um, and generally responsible, respectful, sensitive response to the found materials. Um, transcription, uh, sorry, um, both disciplines involve types of transcription, uh, but they're quite different in method and objective. Transcription in the ethnomusicological sense um, means rendering in notation the sounds heard, recorded, or notated in some prior form. Um, this involves many tricky decisions about the conceptual structure of the music as manifested by the notation. And as Buzoni taught us, every notation is a transcription of an idea. Uh, and so any transcription runs the risk of falsifying or distorting that idea. Um, but transcription in the compositional sense is a freer representing and reacting to a piece, corpus, or a style. In terms of the compositional kind of transcription, we can return to Busoni's own terminology. He distinguished between Bearbeitung and Übertragung, uh, Bearbeitung being a more straightforward processing or treatment of the work, i.e. an arrangement, usually of instruments with a close affinity, thus not requiring, not requiring much adaptation to maintain the initial sonic effect of the music. Uh, by contrast, Übertragung is a kind of carrying over of the essential material into a different sonic medium requiring adaptations to preserve by different sonic means the geist of the original. Uh, and my teacher, Michael Finnessy, uh, the English pianist and composer, built upon Busonian transcription and forged his own kind of Übertragen Plus, uh, in which the goal is not necessarily, uh, and often not, often not at all, to preserve the geist or the gist of the found object. Um, we can therefore distinguish between uh, writing within a tradition and reacting to a tradition. Um, and in the case of uh, Übertragen Plus, as I call it, uh, the composer alludes to so there are uh, certain materials. So there's intertextuality uh, and a kind of elevate, elevated and erudite discourse happening in the music. Um, or there's a kind of reaction to, so it's, it's a kind of commentary or a discursive um, interaction with the material and there can also be problematizing so there can be satire polemic and question questioning of the material um, in all kinds of transcription ethnomusicological and creative objective distance is important um, so there needs to be a sufficient digestion a kind of reassembly and projection through different lenses or filters uh, that is required to avoid an uncritical kind of cultural appropriation. So I want to address an important question. Why should I engage in Chinese, with the Chinese materials at all? Why should I be interested in undertaking this sort of transcription? Um, the question has both a simple and a complex answer. The simple answer is that I'm simply attracted to the music. Um, uh, and, uh, You'll remember my anecdote about uh, the experience of first discovering that there were different schools of Gujang playing that excited my curiosity and captured my imagination. Um, but there is a more complex answer that I want to share with you. Uh, during my years in China and Taiwan, I have encountered on numerous occasions the prejudicial view that I, as a non-Chinese, would not be able to learn to compose for Chinese instruments or to compose vocal music using the, the Mandarin language. And the argument was that, in the first instance, the Chinese musical aesthetic and instrumentarium are both too different and too subtle 
Um, and in the second instance, that the tonal aspect of the Mandarin language meant that a foreigner would not be able to set Mandarin in a natural or intelligible way. And it is my nature that as soon as I'm told that uh, something that I know logically to be feasible is unfeasible, uh, I'm compelled to disprove the claim. Um, these are without doubt enormous impediments. Chinese instruments are indeed difficult to write for versatilely. Um, and uh, likewise, Mandarin Chinese is extremely difficult to set to music, mainly because of the paucity of syllables, um, as well as the difficult question of the tones which we addressed earlier. These impediments are not, however, insurmountable, and I am, to my mind, satisfied that over the last few years, I have proven the doubters wrong on both questions. Now, there is a third reason, however, why I have been motivated to forge my own ways of composing for Chinese instruments and setting text to music, Chinese text to music. Uh, we, we could call this a kind of anti-ideological or anti-essentialist motivation. Uh, in order to explain my meaning, I want to share three quick anecdotes. So the first one is that around um, 2016, I noticed that the National Arts Council annual funding application uh, explicitly stipulated in its rubric that it required composers' projects to take the promotion and reinforcement of Chinese traditional culture as a prime obje objective in order to receive funding. And this entirely excluded, for instance, projects that simply wanted to explore modernist compositional techniques uh, or non or non chinese aesthetic trends and necessitated the inclusion of some aspect of traditional chinese culture in the project um, I noticed a distinct change in the sorts of pieces composers were sharing at conferences and that were being programmed in concerts I can only offer this as an anecdotal impression as I have not done a quantitative quantitative assessment, uh, but the change left a strong impression on me. The second anecdote is that um, in 2017, when I was Dean of Composition at the Tianjin Conservatory of Music, I encountered for the first time this notion um, of the Chinese school. And this has emerged uh, entirely inorganically and imposed from the top down. Um, I remember a lecture from the um, the president uh, and tellingly the deputy party secretary of the Chinese Conservatory of Music, who is also a composer, um, uh, uh, when he came to lecture at Tianjin Conservatory, he proselytized the notion of the Chinese school, arguing that this was something that, that it was essential to nurture in China for the sake of Chinese composers' sense of national identity. He used one of his own compositions as an example of what the Chinese school should be, a folk pop song, a folk pop song with an entirely pentatonic melody and modal triadic harmony orchestrated with Chinese instruments. Um, and he also considered the music video, uh, which was set on the, on the Tibetan grasslands, sung by a rustic maiden in traditional dress to be an essential part of the aesthetic effect. Uh, he explicitly linked the Chinese school to ide ideology, arguing that the Chinese composer's music should express an ideological position. Uh, when I quietly asked him after the lecture which ideology he meant, he admitted that there were, of course, many different ideologies, but it seemed clear that he did, did not mean that Chinese composers were free to explore whatever ideology they wanted in their compositions. There was a clear instrumentality to his conception of the place of musical composition in China. And finally, the third anecdote is something that happened to me last week. A former student from the Tianjin Conservatory wrote to me to ask for my advice. She is researching Chinese-American composer Zhou Long's 2011 Pulitzer Prize winning opera, Madam White Snake, uh, the plot of which is, um, is based upon a Chinese myth. The student asked me the following questions. Why does the composer use atonal music to express a Chinese traditional story? Chinese music is pentatonic. The melodic intervals are relatively consonant. By using atonality, wouldn't the dissonant intervals lead the audience to believe that this is not Chinese music? Are there any ways in which the singing style of the opera tells the audience that the white snake myth is Chinese music, that it's Chinese culture? Um, uh, I wrote a very long answer, which I shall not repeat here, but I think that it would be enough to point out that the composer Zhou Long has not lived in China for at least 30 years. 
The questions this student asked me at least demonstrate the essentialist and nationalist ideology that dominates the discourse among Chinese music students. So is there an alternative approach to ethnic materials? In Hook, I'm trying to find another way of engaging with Chinese traditional culture without inscribing any particular ideologies, um, although I acknowledge that I may well be unwittingly doing so. Is Hook an apolitical piece? Necessarily not. It is de facto political by virtue of choosing not to inscribe the ideas of the Chinese school. Uh, for me, though, it is more of an assertion for myself that I, a Westerner, can compose for Chinese instruments uh, and can absorb and sensitively channel, refocus and reimagine traditional gestural and stylistic patterners. It is also an assertion, cultural rather than geopol geopolitical, for the place where I currently live and work. Um, that is that Taiwan is an alternative model of Chinese culture. And finally, I just want to introduce to you very briefly um, a new project which I'm working on. Um, the title is Artificial Intelligence as a Tool and Inspiration for the Composer, exploring the potential applications of machine learning and human AI co-creation in musical composition with specific application to machine learning uh, trained using original Guzheng music. And this is a collaboration with a Glasgow-based scientist, Lex O'Brien, and uh, the goal is to uh, use the seven constituent materials of the of hook um, as a form uh, um, to form the basis for training a, a machine learning algorithm to compose Guzheng music in my style. Um, so it's a kind of extension of transcriptional practice, both asking the AI to transcribe different sorts of Guzheng playing, but also to transcribe or uh, imitate my style of using those materials um, and uh, the research questions I've I've put here but uh, to save time I won't read them now um, and uh, we've developed some strategies for um, feeding the AI sufficient amounts of raw data because hook is only a 11 minute long piece but we need an hour's worth of material to train the the algorithm. Um, so um, this involved using various improvisations, getting the player to improvise on the material from hook, uh, and also using different scordaturas so that the gesture and the texture of the music would be the same, but the pitch content is different, um, as well as harvesting lots of different snippets from the rehearsal. So in the end, we did end up with um, a lot more than an hour's music. So hopefully we should get some good results from the training. Um, so finally, I want to um, I want to finish with some comments on the aesthetic importance of the intertextuality that transcription of different kinds can create. Is the perception of the presence of an intertext on the part of the listener crucial to an appreciation of the work? I know different, I'm sure from many other artists, try to create works that communicate on multiple levels. Uh, and so just as I attempt to create deep structures in the realm of pitch, tempo or motivic relations that would be perceptible to a superb or superhuman ear, and therefore opening up an extra dimension of meaning that is available for appreciation or interpretation by the listener that perceives it, I also attempt to make the music rich in intertextuality that may be consciously appreciated or at least instinctively felt by a listener who is au fait with the same things that I am. The value of transcription therefore lies in this potential to generate a multiplicity of layers of meaning in the music. I want to offer some final comments on the national versus global question. Music is not a universal language. Rather, it is a series of languages, dialects and idiolects. Like language, any musical dialect or idiolect is a hybrid of manifold influences. There is no obligation to write the music of your tribe or your nation, because that is not a fixed, unchanging stylistic phenomenon. On the contrary, national styles, as well as the styles of different cultural movements and schools, and indeed personal style, are a kind of statistical aggregate of the output of all its participants. And therefore, it is in a constant flux and gradual evolution. 
Why stipulate one's nationality or ethnicity as the principal factor in the style of one's creative output? There are many other important factors that influence the cultural hybrids that constitute our compositional styles. Stylistic identity must be a hybrid of many influences in order for artistic practice to evolve. Culture, like a biological organism, needs to evolve in order to contain, continue to maintain expressive power for the time in which it is made. This can only occur when unhindered by political interference. Um, Except for the most cynical and manipulative commercial music, all music is essentially traditional, part of some tradition. Otherwise, it is amnesiac, ahistorical, naive. The value of the music cannot derive from its being traditional, as it is trivially so. Tradition is not intrinsically good. A cultural practice may become traditional by historical accident and not necessarily owing to its intrinsic goodness. Cultural practices and therefore traditions can lose their value by losing their relevance, communicative power and ritual potency. The greatest contribution that you can make to whatever group or groups to which you feel you belong is to be as holy and truly yourself as possible. Thank you for listening. Thank you, George, so much for your masterclass and also the structure of the masterclass that oh. you gave us. Um, I have many questions, but I will start just with the first one and then I will give to you the possibilities for further questions. I am interested to the creative process from the moment that you have, let's say, all those techniques and to, to which geographic region they belong yeah. until you have the musical piece. Yeah. How did you work for that? <laughs> um well uh i i tried to think about which is it's, it's a very hybridic process actually you're doing a lot of things all at the same time it's holistic and so i'm thinking about which um which vertical sets are going to map best onto the different styles and i'm also thinking about um, the relationship of the the mood of each line of the poem to the different textures of the different schools and trying to sort of um, improvise my way through to find the best sort of marriage of all of these different elements. So you hear in your mind, they'll say the first 30 seconds and then you write them or you improvise in your mind and then you uh, write them down. Well, actually, I, I I would I started with the cantilena. Yeah. So I I composed this without any prejudice, thinking about what which school was going to be mapped yeah. onto which bit, or, or you know, um, and and then use and then use this almost quasi mechanically as a kind of as a thread. As I said, yeah. it's a kind of thread which which helps me to find my way through the piece. Yeah. yeah, I find that like just taking some late piece of Beethoven, that there is from one side yeah. a structure, a big structure, yeah, and from the other side an expression, an emotion, the combination of both. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Questions from our community? Everyone probably wants to have go and have coffee. coffee. <laughs> <laughs> So many questions here. Uh, I, 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 I'm also particularly interested, um, are there any Taiwanese instruments that you can find only in Taiwan and not in the mainland that they are now somehow be reinvented or... Uh... That is a good question. Um, I would say that there, there certainly are. Um, but I can't think of them at the moment. Yeah. 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 But there must be. Yeah. yeah. And, and you spoke about your alternative way of approaching. Yeah. yeah. If you have done this in China, mainland, would yeah. this have been dangerous? Well, no, I don't I don't think it would have been dangerous. No. Um, or you will lose your job as the dean. No, 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 no. No, I don't think no. Um, because I don't think there's anything actually controversial in the piece. Um, but I think um I think the atmosphere of the piece might, um, because it's just a fairly melancholic piece. So um, 
I'm not sure if it would be considered to be a um, a good, even if I were a Chinese person, I don't think it would be considered to be a particularly central version of the uh, Chinese school. But in Taiwan, yeah. it's all fine. Uh, no, I think it went down quite well at the premiere. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, just thank you. I appreciate very much the piece, but as well uh, performance. And my question is: Are there more instrumentalist performers in Taiwan? To play this, this stuff, which is quite complicated and rhythmically, and uh, mm. it comes from Western musical tradition. Yeah, because uh, you know you always have problems with performing your music. So, what is in your situation? Um, I think contemporary music is is strong in Taiwan, actually. Um, a lot of um, there's a, been a, a huge number of uh, Taiwanese musicians who have gone abroad to study, um, and it, uh, the same is true in China. Um, of course, um, performers on traditional Chinese instruments aren't very likely to travel to the West to study. So, um, uh, but but you, I still feel that um, there's. Uh, in the Taiwanese music scene, um, performers are quite open-minded and um, um, and very very skilled. So both of the performers who have who played hook, uh, I don't know if I can find them. Yeah, so both of these performers are absolutely superb and um, rhythmically very very precise um, and very very uh, intelligent musicians. Um, so it, it was a joy to work with both of them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Further questions? May I ask, uh, did I hear you say that one of your projects is to delegate the job of writing your own music to AI? Is it that simple? <laughs> Uh, no, it's not. It's not. No, no, no. Isn't it? Well, no. Actually, I skipped over a detail. No, that's a very good question. At the, at the moment, um, owing to limitations of memory, um, it's not possible to get uh, algorithm. You know, machine learning algorithms to generate long stretches of music. So um, the syntactical aspect of music is still something which is rather beyond the capabilities of machine learning to imitate. Um, so I, as a kind of composer curator, will have the job of assembling the materials which the AI generates. Um, so I'm not trying to delegate the job of um, composition to an AI. On the contrary, um, I'm trying to generate a kind of in what what is known as a centaur. So you know the uh, in 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 Greek myth the centaur is a half man half horse kind of figure. And so this concept of the centaur in AI refers to the marriage of a, of a human and an AI working together to create art. Um, and so that's something that I'm working with um, my collaborator to try and explore. But it's very, very early days. So I haven't got anything to share with you yet. Maybe next year I'll have some some results which I can share with everyone. Well, it is intriguing. And the word centaur, is this an idiom in, in AI, the AI community? Uh, yeah, um, it, it was first um, used in reference to chess playing. So a chess player using an AI to assist. And so there was this notion that the instincts of the human and the, the analytical calculative capabilities of the AI combined would actually produce a stronger re result than just using one or the other. Thank you. Intriguing. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, really beautiful piece, beautiful presentation. I just wanted to ask uh, about the reason uh, playing on the other side of that uh, instrument. Was there kind of a poetic decision or conceptual, uh, let's yeah. say, or, or even maybe s structural? Yeah. Uh, 
it, it was partly poetic and partly structural. So as I mentioned, uh, the last line of the poem describes this kind of no ordinary taste in the heart. So this very strange feeling that Liu must have felt in captivity, having lost his kingdom and knowing that he was very likely to be executed. And he eventually was. Um, and um, and on, on the other hand, uh, because of the tri-rotational structure of the piece, so the cantilena comes three times through the piece, I wanted a kind of very different material which would mark the end of each rotation. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Further questions? Okay. Uh, may I ask, ask you? I yes. thank you thank you very much for the uh, extremely interesting presentation and in ukraine we have experience when the composer write the music uh, for a different instrument for example for uh, gujan uh, and bandura for example what do you think about alternative timbre reality for the gujan music it's important for example, uh, can we uh, imagine the performance of Gujan music uh, by prepared uh, piano or uh, harp, uh, Celtic harp, or uh, in other style? Thank you. Oh, so your your question is about the possibility of using Western instruments to perform Gujan music. Am I understanding you correctly? Uh, so, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, that's that's uh, I think that's perfectly viable, and um, I've actually th been thinking recently that I'd like to try and arrange a piece for which was originally for another Chinese instrument called a gu qin, um, which is also a kind of um, zither um, for guitar. Um, so I think that there's definitely a, a, a the the potential for doing this kind of arrangement. Um, I think it would be the uh, übertragen rather than the uh, bearbeitung uh, because uh, because of the 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 very great level of specificity uh, in the construction and the sound of chinese instruments um it's very difficult to find an exact analog in western instruments and so there is a you're transferring the material into a different kind of sonic medium um and so there would be a, a greater level of adaptation that's required Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Just a small comment uh, from what I, I'm not really an expert on Phoenician transcription, but yeah. from what I get from it, yeah. it's kind of a transcribing music, musical material from one paradigm, from one culture to another culture, another paradigm, like from eastern understanding to western if you use such appropriations mm -hmm. uh, and i find your piece to be exactly that uh, like uh, transcribing all the schools into western contemporary context mm -hmm. and uh, relating to olena's comment i i really can see the principles that you demonstrated here of like traditional gujang playing to be applicable to any western instrument and which has technical capabilities or even like small ensemble of like woodwinds or strings mm. i think it would work just brilliantly mm. okay thank you yeah that's a good idea yeah yeah just a quick comment on finnessy i think that it doesn't have to be a different or an alien culture it could be his own and he often does use transcription as a way of reacting or reflecting upon his own culture and his own origins yeah it, and Continuing with that, making now a com uh, combining now the discussion that we had two days ago and our discussion now. Yeah. Uh, where do I come from? From Graz, which where we have a strong um, avant-garde background. Mm. At least in the nineties, they were telling us take no matter if it is um, an instrumentation string quartet, which is belasted, which means something between often used and abused. Right. Uh, or take some zither, which is a traditional Austrian uh, instrument, and try to reinvent it, to reinvent the sound of the instrument and the group of people. Yeah. So this could fit perfectly to this, um, let's say, aesthetic, which mm. is now you got, let's say, the groove, 
And now you can transpose this groove to a string quartet, mm. which has nothing to do with that. But at the end, we will get the combination of these four specific instruments in a way that we never heard before. Mm. And this will be true to your, let's say, heart or artistical being, because this is a part of your being. And yeah. you don't imitate something. Yeah. Stravinsky or I don't know what. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's maybe an interesting approach. That's a good idea. I could yeah. I could have a go at that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any further questions? I think now we need to to okay. we deserved our coffee. Thank, Thank you, you very George, much. so much. We're very Thank glad you. to have you here. Thanks.